Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. This is the second in a series hosted by KGH Customs Services in the lead up to the UK leaving the EU's customs union at the end of 2020. It is now certain that the UK will leave the customs union at the end of the year, a view shared by both the UK government and the European Commission. A deal on a free trade agreement is increasingly uncertain and it is clear that companies must be in a position to complete import and export declarations between the UK and the EU, whatever the outcome. This webinar will build on the information shared in the previous presentation and detail the arrangements announced in recent weeks and months on the English side of the channel. It will provide a pragmatic view of the clearance arrangements that are required with particular reference to the control of plants, animals and their products, the need for community transit and their associated arrangements, and what happens during the 1st of January to 30th of June next year, how import declarations will need to be resolved, and the role of Customs Freight Simplified Procedures, or CFSP. Steve Gock from KGH Customs Services, their Director of Consulting in the UK, will provide today's presentation. He's joined by Piers Edwards. KGH is UK Sales Director, in who will be facilitating a question and answer session. In order to allow people to continue to join for a short period, we will run a couple of polls today, uh, one at the start, one at the end. And the first poll is, In preparation for Brexit, do you know how you will resolve your UK import declarations for roll-on, roll-off or ro-ro traffic, especially at the Strait of Dover? The options here are yes, no, or you may think it will have no impact on your business. And I'll just leave that open for a few seconds. And a few more are almost at the majority of people having answered. Great, so I'm going to close the poll now. And here are the results. So 52% of you uh, will do know how you will resolve your import declarations. 30% no and 17% no impact on your business. On that note, I'm going to hand over to you, Steve. Thanks very much, Will. So in a way, the results of that poll are effectively what I would expect to see at this time. There are lots and lots of uh, companies out there that have made all their plans and are in a fairly good position. But on a, very, on a, on a daily basis, uh, we are contacted by companies that still have uh, done very little or even have done nothing for Brexit and are looking uh, to resolve their difficulties at this very late moment in the day. Um, just, just to say how this presentation will work, I did one a few weeks ago. Uh, this is going to be the same slide deck that, that, that I used on that occasion. There is a link to that uh, webinar that we will share after this presentation and in fact we'll share a link to this webinar as well. Um, so if you want to rewind and go over that, then then that would be great. I will slow, I will take us through that very briefly as it leads up to the developments that have happened within uh, the last few weeks. So the um, the position, of course, is that the UK is uh, leaving the EU, as Will said. That is definitely the case. And there is going to be a six month implementation window uh, where border controls will start to be implemented more and more at uh, the, in particular, at the roll on, roll off ferry locations. So, in particular, uh, the Straits of Dover. So, in the last webinar, we went through what those general checks would be. Uh, here we have a, a, a picture that shows largely how it works. So, at the beginning, at the top there, you've got the fact that the EU will go straight away to the, the full process model. 
And in the last webinar, I gave some information about how that might look, for instance, at Calais. Well, of, of course, there will be no change because the EU's position is, is very clear cut. Um, in the case of the, the UK, uh, it will be possible to delay uh, import declarations until the end of June for standard goods, controlled goods, uh, they, which are very limited in scope. They will have to be declared earlier. But in the last presentation, I indicated, if you look at the bottom there, that there will be a reduced control on agricultural products. And I'm going to, to touch on what those controls uh, are going to be. Uh, here, I just went through um, the, the increasing level of control over the months. Um, these are the list of control goods. So if you are dealing in any of these, which is mainly it will be people who are dealing in excise goods, um, tobacco, alcohol, that kind of thing, but also things like drug precursors, uh, explosives, the, 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 the usual things that you would expect customs to keep a, a close watch on. But the first part I will talk about is, there are three things I want to bring to you really today. The first is uh, plants, animals, and their products. I know that won't impact on a lot of you, but um, so I'm gonna go through that relatively quickly. Then I'm gonna talk about the importance of community transit, something that largely has been left alone um, all this time, um, but that is that is um, uh, going to be far more popular in, in the future. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to look at the, the pragmatic way of actually making the declarations that are, are now being delayed, uh, theoretically at least delayed at the beginning of next year, because of course you you might be able to make use of them. So um, the general requirements are going to be what you would expect for any other third country import. There is going to be a requirement to present things like health certificates, um, to pre-register the, the, the arrival of goods uh, to the authorities. So um, there's going to be a new a new system to, to do that. So I'll, I'll start there. And so at the moment, because the UK is part of the EU, uh, we get to uh, work under the trade control and expert system, which is called TRACES. And under that, uh, any uh, uh, goods of uh, plant or animal origin, um, are recorded as they move into the community. So if the UK exits the EU without a deal, and of course that is starting to look reasonably likely, that system will no longer be open to uh, UK importers. And so that is being replaced by a system called IPAFS, the import of products of animals, food and feed system. Uh, so anybody who is dealing in uh, foodstuffs that have, um, that just aren't based on pastry or something like that, they're going to have to register. And so you're better off getting getting on uh, and doing that as soon as possible. It doesn't mean to say that everything will have to be registered at the beginning of next year. I'll go through that now. Um, will, just to say, I think you've, you're not on mute. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through these in order. So starting with uh, live animals. Um, so from the beginning of January, there will be a requirement for all live animals to be accompanied by an export health certificate. And the arrival of those good, those animals will have to be pre-notified through IPAS at least one working day in advance of the arrival. And that will give the authorities a chance to decide whether or not they want to inspect that consignment. Um, the, uh, there are additional requirements if they're endangered species, but obviously that's very unlikely. Um, and at this point, those consignments can just enter the UK at a point of entry, but there is no requirement to present them. Uh, but the IPAS system will elect um, the authorities determine whether or not they want to do controls in land. But then by July, uh, entry via uh, port of entry will be required. And it will have to be one that is associated with a border control post. And there will be documentary identity and physical checks on those animals. So realistically, the, the whole system kicks into effect in July. Then we have not just the animals themselves, we have animal, uh, products of animal origin and animal byproducts. And so 
these are categorized either as uh, high risk or, or low risk uh, goods. And the high risk goods are generally contaminated meat, um, condemned meat, things like that. So that's not gonna uh, crop up very often. Um, but from the beginning of January, uh, high risk product will have to be properly declared. Um, but all other, uh, all other animal uh, byproduct goods um, will still need to be accompanied by the official commercial documentation, but there is no need for pre-notification. So come April, so three months in, um, imports of uh, products of animal origin uh, at this point will have to be supplemented, supplemented by an export health certificate and they will also have to go on to IFPAS to be pre-notified in advance. Again, that's a day before the shipment arrives. And then in July, you will have full controls implemented. Uh, and so that means that the entry will have to go by a, a border control point for, again, like the live animals for documentary and physical checks. Uh, fish and shellfish and their products, there's more control over those. Um, so from January, uh, imports of live fish um, in the same way as live animals uh, will have to be pre-notified. There will have to be a, a, an export health certificate. And potentially there will also have to be a catch certificate uh, for marine caught fish. And then in July, in the same way as live animals, you're going to have to go via a border uh, control point. Moving on to plants and plants products. Uh, so the exporter will need to apply for a phytosanitary certificate um, from the competent authority in the country of origin. And this will need to be obtained prior to the goods departure. So obviously that's going to be quite difficult in a lot of cases. And then that has to be sent to the importer for pre-notification purposes. Once the importer's got it, uh, they have to submit to the import notification at least four hours prior to the arrival if the goods are coming by air and it's at least a day um, prior to arrival if they're if it's coming by some other means and in terms of the kickoff date at the beginning of january uh, so if it is high risk um, plant material a phytosanity certificate uh, will be required there will be a pre-import notification requirement and the goods may be checked and inspected on entry to the UK. Again, there's additional requirements for CITES. The only difficulty here is that the list of high risk um, plants and plant products uh, hasn't been announced yet. I mean, it's unlikely to affect anything really, but um, anyway, that hasn't been announced. And then in April, um, there'll be a new requirement applying to all regulated plants and plant products. And so phytosanity certificate, pre-import notification and the goods may be subject to check again. But again, the list of regulated plants and plants products uh, has not been announced. So that's that's the movements that are taking place in the, um, the animal and, and, and plant sector. So last time we, we touched on uh, CFSP, um, for those who, who weren't part of that, I'll give you a quick rundown. That was uh, that's Customs Freight Simplified Procedures. So this is a model which allows you to declare all of your imports that you've made within a month at the end of the month as a series of supplementary declarations. So it removes the need to make a, a full import declaration at the port. And importantly, at the moment, if you work with a freight agent, they currently have to uh, work with you under an indirect basis under CFSP. So they are as equally liable for the payment of tax as you are. Um, but from the beginning of next year, there is going to be an easement, which means that CFSP agents will be allowed to act on a direct basis for their clients, such that they um, can clear their goods and not assume any liability uh, for, for the imports that are made. So skipping forward, I'm now going to give a bit of a rundown on how we see the actual uh, process of making de declarations taking place in 2021. So really there are two options that are open to the importer. You can either have a full declaration, 
So that can either be made at the time that the goods arrive. Um, now, if KGH is working with a client, that is our, our preference because we never want to fall behind with um, the declarations that, 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 that we're making for our, our customers. We don't want to be holding back on a, uh, several months worth of declarations that then need to be processed. But the full declaration can be made either at the time of arrival or following the import within six months. And so an import that takes place in February would have to be declared in July and so on. The alternative is that CFSP declarations will be made. But the, the key thing here is that these must be made via a CFSP approval. So if you don't have one and don't have access to one through your, your broker, then you must make a full declaration before the end of the period. So with a CFSP declaration, it's a monthly return. And so again, our preference is that the clients that we work for, either in their own name, because they have their own CFSP approval, we will make their declarations in January and then February and March and so on. But it is of course possible to delay those declarations. So it could be that again, February's imports were delayed and carried forward uh, to the following July. But again, it's not something that we want really to be involved in. So the question is, CFSP approval, um, the problem at the moment is UK customs are effectively discrediting the value of CFSP at the beginning of next year. If you wanted to get CFSP before now, you had to fight your way to do it because you had to demonstrate to customs at an AEO level that you were capable of controlling uh, the imports that you made and that you could classify your goods properly and on all of the things that were necessary to make a declaration. The problem is, of course, next year, customs have not only said, well, everybody can make use of CFSP because we've got no other way of controlling your imports. They've gone one step further and they've allowed uh, entry into declarants records, which is a uh, simplification that is allowed for only the most trusted of traders. And that is that that generally is only allowed if you're uh, authorized economic operator AEO approved. And so next year, customs have said, well, anybody can use it when they've said in the past that normally you really have to go through a long application process. Eventually, that's going to come back in. And so if you want to make use of a CFSP uh, declaration uh, to clear your goods in 2021, either you have to integrate within your broker's approval or you have to gain your own approval. And to do that is actually quite quite time consuming. And so in the same way as within an AEO approval, you have to fully document your systems and you have to confirm that to customs and they have to give you consent that they're satisfied with that. The same will apply if you're going to make CFSP declarations. So I'll, I'll give you an example. If, if, a, if a broker sets out in life to make CFSP declarations, it needs a client to work alongside unless it makes its own imports. Of course, most don't. And so the first application for CFSP a broker will make is for itself and for its first client. And as part of that application, it must, it must uh, demonstrate its own systems and it must demonstrate the systems of its clients and, pr and put that in the application together. The actual application is, is like a 10 page form, but it is supplemented by a, que a self-assessment questionnaire in the same way as an AEO application is. So you fill out the 10 page questionnaire and then customs come back at you with a, a request for a mass of information. And so you report that into customs. If it's a fresh application, then it can take about four months for customs to look at it and to approve it. So if we're representing a, a client who wants to make to obtain their own CFSP approval, that's the position we start from again. However, we have already got our standard operating procedure approved by customs that's in place. And so we uh, we can bolt that on to the approval that we seek for our customer. But we still actually have to get hold of their standard operating procedure um, as well. So either way, we have to report both into customs. <clears throat> the advantage of doing it through a existing approval is the time, because an, uh, an original application takes about anything up to four months. 
At the moment, customs are saying that they will make an amendment to an existing approval to allow additional trade within about two weeks. So I'll just quickly run through the, the advantages and disadvantages of the importer having their own. Um, so if the importer holds their own, they can move between import brokers uh, and main, maintain all shipments under a single approval. So it could be, for instance, that KGH represented a client in a number of ports, but there was a preference to use another port somewhere else and to use a different agent. Well, of course, that can be consolidated under one approval if the importer holds it themselves. For the broker, for KGH or the likes of us, it means that when we're managing declarations on behalf of our clients, it's it's more readily done because we have a separate approval number. And so that gives us uh, a degree of clarity uh, in terms of the actions we take. And it, it just makes life a lot easier for us. And, um, and the, the scope for error is reduced. Also, liability for duty and everything else clearly rests with the holder of the authorization. I mentioned earlier that direct representation becomes possible uh, at the beginning of next year. But if I move over to the disadvantages, um, one, there is no certainty at this time that um, CFSP will be open to non-UK companies. However, uh, all of the, the, the sounds that are coming out of customs will be that it is. Um, but the time frame and the time frame for approval is is four months, um, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but it, here, there is an a, additional advantage that the CFSP approval. It doesn't matter if if HMRC at a later date change the the rules to do with direct and indirect representation, because it's always going to be at the the, the liability of the the holder. So moving on to the, the case where the broker holds the approval, as I've indicated, there's a speed of integ integration as long as you can bring together the, the client's standard operating procedure. But here, the holder cannot move CFSP imports between brokers, unless that is all of the brokers that they work with impl implement them within their own CFSP approval. So it may be that you're effectively making three or more CFSP applications just to allow yourself to do imports when a single approval would let you do it just once. And then, as I've mentioned again, there's the, 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 the issue of direct representation. Now, at the moment, that is in place, but that may not be in place uh, forever and a day. So moving on to, to transit. So transit is something at the moment that is hardly ever used within the, 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 the trade between the UK and the EU. And it will be used to a degree uh, for imports in the same way as it is currently. If you're shipping from Switzerland, maybe, and don't want to declare on the French border, you would uh, come in under transit to the UK. It may, of course, now be that it, uh, uh, a, a flight lands in Germany and the goods are going to be onward supply to the UK by land, and that that is done by community transit. So there, there may be more imports coming into the UK, but the real difference is to do with exports. So again, in the previous uh, webinar, I mentioned that um, if you're doing a export to uh, France, for instance, if you're going to clear those goods at Calais, you will do a UK export with a complementary importation into France, and that's no problem at all. But if you're not going to clear into Calais, if you're going to clear to another French location or into Germany or another member state, then you're going to have to do an export under transit. And at the moment, things really aren't set up in the UK to handle that. So um, a export under transit via the Ch Channel Tunnel or Dover will need to be declared into CHIEF, the Customs Entry Processing System. It will also need to be declared onto the new computerized transit system. And that's probably going to be about 90% of UK exports via uh, Dover and the Channel Tunnel. So that's a hell of a lot of movements that are going to be created within transit that aren't there at the moment. The thing about transit is you have to make the goods available for inspection prior to shipment. And they also have to be covered by a customs guarantee. 
So those are the general principles. So the first thing is that you must have a named place of export. And that can be one of two locations. So it can be the port of departure. So if you were going through Immingham docks, something like that, uh, or Heathrow Airport, there's your port of departure. It's, it's not a problem at all. But if you're going through Dover or the Channel Tunnel, then it is very difficult to present, if not impossible at the moment, to present your goods at that port of departure. And so you need to use uh, an alternative approved premises potentially that is linked to the port of departure. So that could be a customs warehouse or a temporary storage facility that otherwise known as a transit shed. And so you can present them somewhere else or you can go for a pre-approved system and you can become what's called an authorized consigner. And so that can be held by the exporter or it can be um, the hauliers or the customs brokers. And that can be utilized by the, the, the customer who's making an export. Now within that authorized consigner approval, there will be nominated jump off points. And so let's say uh, KGH has an authorized consigner approval and it works regularly with 10 companies. Each of those 10 companies could nominate the places where they would normally start transit and it would generally be their warehouses or something like that. Anyway, when the goods are ready loaded on the vehicle, at that point under transit, the declaration can be submitted. It goes into chief, it goes into the NCTS system, and you'll get a reply back saying, that movement is fit to travel, in which case um, you can go straight to the Channel Tunnel or Dover Docks and proceed on your way. Or it may say in a very, very unlikely scenario that customs want to inspect the goods. And then you have to remain at that location for the inspection to take place. The difficulty with transit, of course, is you may well have a vehicle that isn't just taking a load for one person. It may be taking a load for 10 different companies. And so it has pickup points all over the country. And so it doesn't know where it's going to leave from. And so if that's the case, the authorized consigner model generally falls out of um, falls out of the system. Unless you nominate a number of facilities around the, the country where you can go to once you pick up your last load and, and, and leave, which is why you get things like transit sheds nearby the ports where people can turn up to declare the transit ready to go and then move to the frontier. So as I indicated, there are two possibilities. There's the external temporary storage facility and the authorized consigner. Um, both are AEO level measures. So it's a similar situation to CFSP. You have to demonstrate that you have controls before you're granted the approvals. Um, in the case of the temporary storage facility, the transit begins there. And so if the transit facility is nearby Dover in, in the Kent area, then the vehicle could move there declare itself ready to travel. It doesn't even have to go into the building because you can do it automatically. Uh, it declares itself ready to travel. And if it gets the, the green light to, to go, then it's on its way. If it gets told no customs are going to arrive and inspect, then it would obviously have to stay. Um, guarantees, they always have to be in place. So uh, an external temporary storage facility is not dependent on a UK comprehensive guarantee. Uh, rather, when you're setting up the uh, the export and the, the guarantee within, uh, sorry, the transit within NCTS, you also have to show that you've got a guarantee in place. And that could be from a centralized one from any provider within the area covered by uh, the, uh, the EU-wide or uh, European-wide uh, system. Most importantly, the client of the operator does not need prior approval by HMRC. So anybody who's given green light to use that transit facility, who has the right paperwork filled out, no matter who the haulier is or who the agent is, as long as the owner of the facility is happy for them to do so, they can turn up and they can be, be uh, given the green light to go. And this is in particular suitable for multiple pickups. With the authorized consigner, there is pre-approval. It takes two months to get um, set up. Um, but you can have the situation where an agent's approval can cover its uh, client shipments. Again, you need HMRC's consent prior to the goods 
uh, departing that that point of departure is approved and as a result it's not generally suitable for multiple pickups. <clears throat> so the last thing that um, I want to cover off before I know Piers has got some questions is to do with um, what's happening currently at Dover and so uh, yesterday I was down at um, Ashford um, KGH are developing a export transit facility down there. Uh, I've got two images for you here so at the moment HMRC on the right hand side are uh, building this uh, Mojo facility which stands for uh, M20 Motorway Junction 10A so Mojo um, but this is going to be their border uh, facility and if you look towards the, um, the left hand side of the image you can see a very straight line um, running alongside it that that is the uh, the train line that runs from London to the Channel Tunnel um, to the left of it you can see a brown site so this aerial photograph was taken quite a while ago the the Mojo facility is now very brown because they bulldozed a lot and they're actually building the border inspection facility the, the the site to the left which is a brownfield site there is actually now developed and that is where there is a international truck stop that can take 600 vehicles and that is where hmrc and border force are setting up their border inspection post and so the the road sign you can see on the left it's freight clearance facility at, at waterbrook so the waterbrook facility is there and that's temporary and so that's that's the the arrangements that are, are coming on stream at the moment so that's basically all that's changed in the last few weeks. I know Piers has got a good number of questions and we've got about 10 to 15 minutes left. So Piers, can I, um, can I ask you for the, the first of those? Absolutely. Thank you everyone for sending your questions through. We'll try and get through as many as we can. The first question, there has always been some doubt in relation to the benefits of an AEO approval. Does Brexit mean that these are now clear? Okay, I think that probably means. Does it mean that, that it's not so much in doubt that they are a pro, um, that there are no benefits? Um, so, if you were AEO approved now, and very few companies in the UK are, but if you were AEO approved now, for instance, um, you could get an authorised consigner approval without too much difficulty at all, because you've already demonstrated your level of of, of competence. In addition, if you were the type of person that was going for a transit facility. Uh, near to a port then that would help you greatly so in the past I've not been a great advocate for AEO but it's certainly starting to look like that there will be real benefits from it and so people who are in particular regularly exporting to the continent I could definitely see the, the, the appeal in it so hopefully that answers that one next one what position what is the position in relation to duty deferment accounts is it correct that no customs guarantee will be required? Okay, so customs have said that this is um, going to be the case next year. So at the moment, if you want a duty deferment statement, a, a duty deferment account to account for your duty on a monthly basis, you uh, require a comprehensive customs guarantee to get one. Now, at the moment, you still need that. We've been trying to get customs to confirm that that isn't actually required if you're just going to get one for next year but they haven't done so yet so yeah theoretically from the 1st of january at the moment if you apply to customs for a duty deferment account you'll be able to get one without a, um, a guarantee but having said that um, there may well be a limit on how much you can guarantee and at the moment you don't you won't have to guarantee vat and put vat but you will have to guarantee duty and it may be relatively limited we're not sure that's that one. All right. Question number three. Is the UK prepared for the level of export transit and will there be sufficient third party guarantees? OK, well, I, I, I have touched on that in terms of will, will there be sufficient uh, third party guarantees? I think there probably will. Um, I know KGH as an organisation has upped its transit guarantee significantly and it's in the many tens of millions now. Um, I did speak to one particular supplier of uh, transit to see what they were doing. And I think they've upped their guarantee to the better part of 100 million. 
So I, I think the cover is out there. Um, just to say for those who um, aren't aware of transit, it is reasonably expensive compared to a straightforward export because you have to not only get your export document, you have to get your transit document. And then potentially, if you don't have your own guarantee, you have to pay for the right to use somebody else's guarantee. Um, and clearly, all of that can add up. So a single transit export of, of reasonable value, you may be paying 100, 120, even more uh, for the export um, declarations that you need created. OK. All right, number four. Is it correct that a CFSP approval only needs to be in place by the end of June 2021. Yeah, that would be the case. So if you've got, um, if you're making imports uh, with the assumption that you're going to declare them under CFSP, um, then yes, you basically have nearly 10 months from today to get your CFSP approval in place or to integrate yourself uh, with a provider of uh, who has CFSP already. Number five, you sort of touched on this early on, but when will the list of high risk plant products be released? Uh, that I don't know, I'm afraid. It, it shouldn't, I would hope it shouldn't be too long, but I think the truth is it won't really affect um, that, many, um, that many shipments anyway. I, I couldn't even think of what a high risk plant would be unless it was something that was poisonous. All right, number six, for those in Kent, how bad will the congestion be around Dover? Um, it's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, at the moment, I don't think the preparations that have been made by the authorities are anyway good enough. And the one thing I would point to more than anything else is export transit. Um, at the moment, if, if you want to import, you've got a green light, you can do what you please. As long as that vehicle arrives on the, the channel tunnel or a ferry, nobody's going to stop it. Um, but going the other direction, um, we can't do anything but play the game of making proper export declarations and transit declarations. There's no way around that. And the number, if you imagine a lorry that is is leaving and it's got 10 consignments on it, and they have multiple brokers maybe who have submitted the uh, the declarations for those, there, there is all sorts of scope for difficulties. And of course, if 10, 20, 30 lorries get held up, then very quickly the motorways will grind to a halt. So I think um, at the moment that is a very real danger in, still in the first two or three months. All right, you touched on uh, transit there, but what can what can I expect to pay in order to manage an export under oh, okay. transit? Um, yeah, uh, well, kind of like I've just said, actually, it is an expensive business compared to making a, uh, an import or a standard export because the amount of documentation involved is more. But there is also the fact that you're relying on somebody's guarantee. You could have your own in place, but if you're relying on somebody else's guarantee, then they take risk. So what happens is if, let's say, your goods go missing in France and all of a sudden you owe French VAT um, and uh, the duty on the consignment, well, one, you've lost the consignment potentially, and that's causing you difficulties. Now you have to come up with a tax that was due in France and you're not that registered in France. So you'll have difficulty recovering that money anytime soon. And so that could put a company out of business quite clearly. Um, and if that happens, then the guarantor they, is the person that the authorities go to next to call that money to account. And so there's risk for them. And of course, they charge for that risk. Um, I think reasonably typically, um, a, a transit guarantee to make use of one might cost 30 or 40 pounds for a reasonable consignment. Um, and then once you get over a certain value, I've certainly seen around I think from £25,000 value upwards, um, people start to charge one one thousandth, I can't say it, one one thousandth of the value of the consignment um, to use a, a guarantee. I did a, a consignment for somebody with a, a, a £10 million um, aircraft engine 
and and the fee for the the transit was sixteen thousand pounds. So it can be very expensive. Hopefully that answers that one. Thank you. And the last one: How ready do you think the UK is for Brexit, especially in relation to exports? Okay, I mean, I, I, I suppose it's kind of beating the same drum, but for a lot of companies um, who've been planning, preparing for years, obviously things are, are looking quite good. Um, and in terms of imports, again, reasonably speaking, there's there's not a lot to go wrong. The, the real difficulty is going to be the export side of things. And I'll keep, keep coming back to it, but it is going to be the transit arrangements that... Uh, potentially kills, um, not kills UK trade, but to a certain extent puts a real shackle on it. Because if you're not going to do transit, then you will have to do your import into France. And to do that, you will have to be VAT registered in France, because otherwise you won't be able to recover the import VAT that you pay. And obviously getting a French VAT registration is, is it doesn't happen necessarily that quickly. And then you, if you've paid the money, then you have to recover it. And so the whole export through Dover is fraught with endless difficulties at the moment. And my view is that there just aren't sufficient companies that are setting themselves up properly to take care of that. If I were the CEO of a, a UK uh, company with um, exports to the EU, that would be the thing that kept me awake at night at the moment. So on that doom fill note, um, I, I think that's it. So Will, um, I think that's bringing us to the end of the, the session. So would you like to um, wrap up and run the final poll? Yeah, of course. So we have one last poll, which is how well, how well prepared do you feel that your organization is to manage community transit? The options we have here are uh, very well prepared with all the required permits in place, reasonably well prepared with some outstanding issues being resolved, insufficiently prepared but aware of the issues, unprepared or other, for example, transit will not impact the organisation. And again, I'll just leave that poll to run for a few more seconds. Okay, okay, so five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And we'll now share the results there. So 52% say reasonably well prepared. No one's very well prepared, but um, there, there is time. 39% are saying insufficiently prepared, 7% unprepared, and 2% other. Any thoughts on that, Steve? Um, I I'm not surprised. I mean, to be fair, particularly after what I've just run through, it's, as I say, it's fairly doom laden. But I do, I mean, when Brexit came on the scene, one of the first things that um, seemed to be the biggest problem area was going to be import VAT and people getting uh, stuck with a liability because they didn't own the goods at the time of import. That is still there, but that is something that will only come to light really in, t in due time. The, the thing that really does make me think um, this is a problem, uh, Brexit generally, is going to be the, the export side of things. Um, and I, I often use an analogy, it, you know, you might have a Land Rover and, and uh, the roads are flooded um, and therefore that you feel that you can get around without, a dif without difficulty. The only problem is everybody else is driving a Mini and, and because of that, they're all bogged down and they're not letting you through. I mean, that is the real worry about uh, Brexit and Kent. So the government, I feel, must do a great deal more to get any everybody set for, for, for transit. And that's my, my final word. That cheery note. I think um, it's time <laughs> to end the webinar. So uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. I hope that's been useful. I'm going to close the webinar now. <laughs>